Um, just by a show of hands, I know this is not really a fun topic, foster care, but just by a show of hands, how many of you here have either heard or believe that the foster care system is broken? So just by a show of hands, you've either heard it or you yourself believe it. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to just start off by saying that when Junko from Life Ray had contacted me um, to speak back in April, she was telling me a little bit about Life Ray, and I didn't really know. So the first thing that I did is I went to the website and I looked at the company to see who are you, and I was just absolutely amazed that the mission statement says that we make it possible for people to reach their full potential to serve others. I spent about 20 seconds on the website and knew that I wanted to be a part of this event because of that statement right there. Because that statement is exactly what we do at Austin Angels. So we empower our foster children to succeed. I also love that it said produce excellence, lead by serving, value people, grow and get better, and stay nerdy. I love that. So yesterday at the Candy Graham station, uh, a gentleman had asked me, why do children enter the foster care system? And so most people um, know that children enter because of abuse, either sexual or physical. They also enter the foster care system because of drugs, neglect, and also abandonment. So just by a show of hands, how many knows what the national prison population of former foster care children how many of you know what the statistic is for this? Anybody? You cheated. What is it? That's right. So 80% of our prison population is made up of former foster care children. And so what that means is that our tax dollars goes for these children to live a mediocre life at best, only to age out of care, and ultimately end up in prison. How about the homeless population? Does anybody know what the national statistic for homeless population is? No? 50%. So when you pull up to a sign and you see a young person holding a will you give me money um, sign, I don't know if, um, if you do this, but you might say, can't you get a job? We, we uh, live in the greatest country. Can't you get a job? And the truth is, is that these children are treated so poorly that they age out and they have nowhere to go but the streets. High school, only 50% of children will actually graduate high school. The reason for that is because so many of these children move. So on average, a child will move in the foster care system seven times. So that seven new sets of mommies and daddies, seven new sets of friends or lack thereof, teachers. And so that is why only 50% actually graduate high school. And then we talk about college. How many of these children are actually going to college? So here in Central Texas, right now, we have about 3,400 kids in Central Texas on the CPS caseload. And what the statistics say is that only 3% will actually go on to college, even though they can go to any state school that they want to for free. So 97% of them are not going to college. Pregnancy. 50% of girls, by the time they're 19 years old, will be pregnant with their second child. And 75% of those children will go into the foster care system. So what's that mean? what that means is that the cycle just repeats itself. When we talk about human trafficking, 80% were, were former foster care children. So I want to tell you how we got started focusing on foster care. So this is a story of Jimmy on the left and Johnny on the right. Uh, both of these children went into the foster care system at two years old. Uh, due to abuse and neglect, uh, both of their moms, they were both raised by a single mom. Um, drugs were involved. And um, the little boy on the left-hand side of the screen, their story was exact, is exactly the same. And so I went into a conference about uh, foster care and adoption. And when I went, there was a judge who told this story. And he showed a picture just like this on the screen. And he said, well, right when we sat down, he said, I'm going to just list all of the abuse that these children had taken. And so right when I sat down at this conference, I was reading about this horrific abuse that had happened to these two little boys. And what had happened was these two little boys went in through the foster care system all the way until they were 18 years old. 
And so the little boy on the left-hand side of the screen was always really smart. So no matter how many times he actually got moved, he would always excel in school. And at eight years old, both of the boys' parental rights had been terminated, which means now they're eligible for adoption. And so the little boy at eight years old, they would go to these things called picnics. And picnics are what's available for mommies and daddies who are open to adoption. They can go to these picnics and they can meet some of the children who are available for adoption. And so at eight years old, these little boys, they begin to go to these picnics, um, hoping that they would find their forever family. But year after year after year, they never get chosen. And so the little boy on the left-hand side of the screen says, what, what can I do to show my self-worth? How can I prove to these mommies and daddies that I'm worthy of being loved? Well, as a mother, I know that no child should ever have to prove that they are worthy of being loved. But the little boy says, I know what I can do. I can take my report card. I can take my report card and I can go up to all the mommies and daddies and I can show them I make good grades. I'm worthy of being loved. And so he does that year after year after year and he never gets chosen. So by the time these boys turn 18 years old, what it, oh, excuse me. By the time these boys turn 18 years old, they have now been in and out of 22 and 23 different placements. They're now living in an orphanage home. And at 18 years old, the orphanage director comes to the little boy on the left-hand side of the screen and he says, son, you have been adopted. And he says, what do you mean I've been adopted? I've wanted to be adopted my whole life. And he says, you have been adopted and your father will be here soon to get you. And so the young man had grabbed just a garbage sack full of belongings because that's all he had collected in the 18 years. And he's standing on the steps of the orphanage home waiting for his father. And his father comes to him and, and he says to him, son, I am sorry that it has taken me this long to find you and that I have prayed for you my whole life and I'm sorry but you don't ever have to worry about where you will spend Christmas or your birthday, that you are my son, and we want you to come home with us. And so the little boy had moved in, and they put him through college, and then they put him through seminary school. And the miraculous thing is that today, this man now runs and operates the largest foster and adoption agency in Texas. And at that moment, the, the guy that was doing the conference said, you know, not everybody's called to foster. And not everybody's called to adopt, but everybody can play a role and make a difference in a child's life. And he said, the other little boy on the other side of the screen that has the same amount of abuse and neglect, that little boy turns 18 years old, and he has no direction. He has no idea what he's going to do or what he's going to become, because no one has ever spoke truth into his life that he matters. And so he turns 18 years old, and he leaves the orphanage that day with his grocery sack full of belongings. And he begins to walk. And he begins to walk, and he begins to walk until he can find the nearest freeway. And he throws himself in front of an 18-wheeler, and he commits suicide. And the conference leader again said, not everybody's called to foster, but we don't know what that kid was supposed to grow up to be. These are our future doctors and lawyers and tech folks and um, all the things. And so we have to invest in our youth so that they grow up to be and reach their fullest potential. And so at that conference, I really felt as if I wanted to carry the weight of this organization. I wanted to help make a difference in these children's lives. I didn't want to be part of the problem. I wanted to be part of the solution. So after I left that conference, I went back to my team and I said, we're going to start making a difference and we're going to start changing kids' lives in foster care. And I don't want to do something that helps just solve a symptom. I want to solve a problem. And what I mean by that is you heard me say earlier about the grocery sack full of belongings. Well, we know that children, when they move home from home to home to home, they get a black trash bag. We don't even give these children the luxury of having luggage. And so there are organizations that go and give luggage to children, which is great, but that's not solving the problem and that doesn't rewrite their statistics that says 80% that says will be in prison and so on and so on. So we launched a pilot program uh, in 2000, October of 2013. We said, how can we begin to be a part of the solution to rewrite these kids' lives? So this is an image here of, of my buddy, Jonathan. And when we started this pilot program, Jonathan uh, was in a home with six boys. 
And Jonathan, out of all six boys that were currently in the home, and all the other boys that had prior had come through this home, the foster mama, her name was Miss Esther, and, and Miss Esther said to me, Susan, out of every boy that I've ever had in my home, Jonathan has the worst case of abuse that I've ever read. In fact, I only got through the first two pages and had to close his file because I couldn't, I couldn't read it anymore. So when we started loving on these kids in this household, Jonathan wouldn't even make eye contact with us. He'd hold his head down, and he had no self-esteem whatsoever. And about eight months into our program of consistently showing up month after month, we knew um, that he'd always wanted to be a football player. And so at school, uh, school was starting back up in August, and we had given each one of the boys in the home a brand new backpack and school supplies. And one of our requirements in our program is that the mentor of the child would actually write a handwritten encouraging note. And so that year in August, I had given Jonathan a backpack and an encouraging note. And I said, Jonathan, I understand that you want to go out for the football team. And he says, yes, I do, but it's never going to happen for me because I've never made a passing grade, not one day in my life. And I said, Jonathan, I just believe that this is your year, and we are going to walk alongside you. We're going to be checking in every week. We want to make sure that you do well this year. And so every single morning, I want you to read this note. So we asked him to tape it up on his board. And so every morning, Jonathan woke up, and he got to read these words that say that your life matters and that you're going to make the football team and that you can do it and that we believe in you. And so Mama Esther calls me at six-week progress report card time, and she says, Susan, you're never going to believe this. The little boy who's never made a good grade a day in his life just brought home his report card, and he had made straight A's. And so at that moment, I really knew that we had something special, because here's a boy who wouldn't make eye contact, who didn't believe in himself, and now all of a sudden, he believes in himself, which is huge. And the best part is, is that four years later, he's the star of the football team. And so I knew that we had just rewrote the whole trajectory of his life because we know what team sports do and we know how, um, how good grades and having community around you can change the path that you're on. And so this is after we got through with a pilot that told us that the kids in our program were attaching. All the kids in our program were making better grades. All the kids were moving down what's the level of care. So what that means is that every time a child gets pulled from their home, and typically what, what happens to children is that um, when, when the CPS worker and the uh, policeman come, they literally walk in and they pull the child um, right out of the home, and it's usually a terrible situation. But the kids don't get to pack up their favorite teddy bear and their belongings. And so we made a program around how do we meet real practical needs of the children and the families that we serve. So we came up with the concept, the love box. And so you'll see here we've got a little volunteer who's doodling on the box, some hearts and some encouragement. And so here we focus on three areas of impact. The first area of impact is intentional giving. So what that means, and so we, employ, we, we ask for corporations and for churches and for small groups to come together. And what we say is get with the people that you already do life with and go and bless some foster kids and their families. And the first area is intentional giving. So what that means is that if there's a group of five of you, one of you would actually go and mentor the children in the home. And you would go back to your group and you would say, hey, Jimmy and Johnny need school supplies. They need socks. They need underwear. They need their favorite snacks. And every month in the box, you would bring them the things that they need and also the things that they want. And it's not about the things in the box that's so important. It's the things that say, your favorite snack is goldfish, then I'm going to bring you goldfish every month because you're important. The second part of our program is called relationship building. And so what that means is that if Jimmy has always wanted to be a soccer player, that the Love Box group would actually pay for his enrollment in soccer and then also buy the equipment. So the uniforms needed, the soccer ball, the shin guards, the cleats. And then the actual Love Box leader would go and pick up the child and take them to practice and build a relationship around the things that was important to the child. So anytime we ask our foster children who age out of care, what's the worst part about being in foster care besides not having a mommy or a daddy? They always say that there's no normalcy for us. We don't get to do sleepovers. We don't get to do extracurricular activities. And the reason why they don't get to do extracurricular extracurricular activities is because the foster parents don't have stipend for that. And so if we can come alongside and help, well, then we've just solved a problem. 
And the last component, which is probably the strongest thing that we do, is the mentorship piece. And so what that looks like is that for children who are in high school, who are about to age out of care, we begin to talk to them about finances. So we actually go and open them up a bank account. We help them to get a driver's license. In fact, while I was driving down here today, I was getting ready to pay for six months worth of car insurance for one of our girls who's aged out of care. And so we want to make sure that we begin to talk to them about jobs and interview skills. And we begin to work on a path with them that they've got three options after they age out. Number one, they will graduate high school. And I'm happy to say that we have a 100% graduation rate within our program. But they've got three options after high school. They're either going to trade school, they're going to college, or they're going to go to a branch of service. And so our mentors actually expose them to all the different options. So they might take them to a recruiter's office. They might take them to go visit a couple of trade schools. They might take them to a couple of college campuses. Um, and that's our mentorship program. And so I just wanted to leave today with this, is that we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And we believe at Austin Angels that it takes a whole community to walk alongside these foster care children. That we're in Austin, but there are foster care children within probably 10 minutes from where you live. And so it's important that you would also take responsibility and help the kids of the community because they are our future and they are our tomorrow. So thank you.